Hello, screenwriters, and welcome to Writing for Screens. I have thoughts when good artists make bad art. My name is Glenn Gers, and I am in charge of Writing for Screens, this channel, which is a bunch of lessons and videos and live streams that I have put together to try to give you some of the things I learned in a 25-year career writing for TV and movies on my way out of the business. I am trying to leave behind stuff that I had to work out for myself so that you, the uh, people working on writing scripts, don't have to rediscover things. You can take those tools, try them out. If they work, use them. If they don't, don't. Not everything I say is gonna work for you. There are no single rules. There is no one way to do this. There is no right or wrong about this. So every artist has to figure out their own way of working and their own goals and their own art. You gotta figure it out for yourself. All I can do is give you some tools, some skills, some techniques, things that I've run into and see if they work for you. Now, the way that I'm giving these to you is primarily here on this channel. Here is a screen capture of my channel page. And on this page, if you look down uh, into the middle of that and the bottom of that, you'll see some playlists. These playlists, Here's a closer shot. Uh, the first three of them are called Screenwriting Essentials, Screenwriting Tools, Skills, and Craft, and The Process, Being a Writer. I beg you to look at these. Each one has uh, little 10-minute videos, just 10, 12 minutes tops, in which I take on a topic, genre, flashbacks, dialogue, character. These are things that I've tried to break down to single lessons that I get as sharp and simple and useful as I can in just 10 minutes. There's no grand theory. There's no overarching system. It's just stuff I think you should know. Please watch those. Sample around. The thumbnails have the title, which is the topic. Nice, big, bold, colorful words there. You can find it. Not a bunch of thumbnails of my face, because who needs that? Okay, let me say some hellos, and then we'll get right into our topics for today. Hello, Nacho. Hello, Doug. Hello, Maritla Toso, and Jay, and Harry Cahill, who I have never met before. Hi, Harry Cahill. Hello, Next Institute, and Hasko Heineke, and Michael Tanaka. Hello, Hofner Hustleman from South Africa, and R. Fung, who is always traveling around. Put your live laughter, Joe. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, that would kind of freak me out, too. Oh, damn. Once again, I have, I have forgotten to change the text color. I'll get into that. Okay, sorry about that, folks. Okay, let me see what's going on here. Um, all right, today, oh, first of all, um, when I'm not doing these uh, lesson videos, I do live streams every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. If you are not watching this live, you are like, when can I see this live? When can I ask a question? The way you do that is you watch the live streams on Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, or you send me an email uh, if you want to ask a question at writingforscreens.com. You can uh, click on the Contact Me button and you'll be able to send me an email. Okay, oh, more people coming in. Greetings from Thumper's bedroom. Hi, Thumper. Um, hello, Alex. Good, having dinner. And Anjali K. Good. Great, everybody. Hi, 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 hello. Let's get into the topic for today. There's two topics, actually. Um, the first one is good artists, bad art. What happens when a good artist, a great artist sometimes, makes bad art. Now, good and bad, obviously, is a matter of opinion. There is no right or wrong. There is no universal agreement on what is good and bad. I'm talking about my uh, personal view. But here's the thing. I have been checking out some things that I watched in the past decades, um, because there's stuff that I would say like, oh, I want to recommend that. The truth is I haven't watched it in 20 or 30 years, and my opinion may have changed. 
the world has changed. So I've been checking out some old stuff, uh, mostly stuff that I thought, wow, I thought that was great. And I'm checking out to see if I still think that. Um, but lately, I looked at two pieces, uh, two feature films from the 1990s that I thought, gee, I remember thinking that was quite bad. Um, and so I wanted to check it. And like, look, these are these are great filmmakers. Were those bad? Uh, the two movies were um, Sabrina, a remake by Sidney Pollack in 1995, and a, a little thriller by Sidney Lumet uh, called Q&A from 1990. I'm not going to put these posters up there and, and link you to them. I, I think these movies are bad. Um, they have good things in them. There's some some good work, of course, but these are not underrated or misunderstood or neglected movies. As far as I can see, they're really not good. They're just not. Um, they're they're uh, awkward. They have they have serious flaws. They're they're just not. They're they're just not good. They're they feel shallow and uninteresting and and forced. Um, okay. Hi, Larry. Um, Oh, <laughs> so Arfung is in Madrid. Okay, good. Uh, good to know. All right, so let's talk about this t these two movies because um, I want to talk about the filmmakers. Um, uh, Sidney Lumet, who made this Q&A, who also wrote it, adapted it from a book. He wrote the script himself. Um, and, and this is a guy who in his career, long, complex career with lots of ups and downs. Um, but among the movies he made are 12 Angry Men, the Pawnbroker, Failsafe, The Anderson Tapes. These are movies that I think are marvelous. Serpico, Murder on the Orient Express, Dog Day Afternoon, Network, Prince of the City, and The Verdict, which I just talked about recently, plus many, many more of which many are really interesting, even if they're not great. Okay, this guy made a lot. I mean, what a career. Truly, truly legendary, influential filmmaker of the 70s and 80s. Uh, likewise, Sidney Pollack, who started in the 60s, he, he did uh, relatively fewer films, um, but among them are Tootsie, Three Days of the Condor, The Way We Were, Jeremiah Johnson, and They Shoot Horses, Don't They? These are some of the greatest films of the late 20th century, as far as I'm concerned. Also, um, some other good thrillers that aren't great, but uh, The Interpreter, Absence of Malice, and Havana are all really interesting and worthwhile movies, I think. The main thing about this is these are, are really great Hollywood filmmakers of the, the late 20th century, and they made two. They made some really bad movies. What can we learn from that? What What is the value of that? Um, now, I do not know the story, the inside story of the how these movies were made. Um, I do know that they were both relatively late works. They're in the 1990s. These people peaked in the 60s and 70s, really, um, uh, and they may have just been on the commercial conveyor belt. They may have just been these. I'm a I'm a working studio. Uh, director, I'm going to just keep making movies, and they may have just not been, they may have not been trying that hard. I don't know. Um, it's also possible that they just got some crap past the machinery that's supposed to make it better. Because they were so legendary, people were not going to say no to them. They were going to say, hey, <laughs> you know, if you're working within a budget and you're working in a genre we like, you you go. I, I suspect both these guys had final cut. Um, they were also both getting old, um, older, Certainly, they weren't old at that point, but they were getting older, um, and it's possible that they were simply tired or um, losing their sense of connection to to society. It's hard to tell when you're a, a super powerful, um, uh, uh, successful movie director in the era of movies. It you are you are kind of like royalty. Um, however, while they may have been getting old, uh, fifteen years later. Um, and eight or nine projects later, Sidney Lumet made a movie called Before the Devil Knows You're Dead, which is his, his last feature uh, starring Philip Seymour Hoffman and Ethan Hawke uh, and, another, and some other great people. It's terrific. It's a really good movie. So there is, there is the age is not the, the issue here. Um, just say some quick hellos. Hello, Trent. Hello, Larry. Hello, Jean. Um, okay, so what we're talking about here is why, what we can learn from the fact that Sidney Lumet and Sidney Pollack, two of my favorite filmmakers, uh, did <laughs> did not. Uh, they made some some bad movies. Um, hold on, um, I'm going to just check Lan. 
Uh, land, uh, I'm in the middle of a topic, so I'm going to get to this topic, this question later. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> Arfang asks, is it possible they didn't make it, just put their name on it? No, no, there is absolutely no way they didn't make these movies. There's a lot about these movies that are distinctly there. Like, you can, you can tell that it's their movie. Um, they're just not that good. Um, they're, they're just clunky. Um, they feel artificial and lifeless. They feel like they're just going through the motions. Um, and sometimes they are counting on things to work which don't work. A certain uh, sense of glamour um, in, in Sabrina and a certain sense of grittiness in, in Q&A that, that just don't work. Um, I don't want to get too into why they're bad. I mean, you can <laughs> try and watch them. I got to tell you, I couldn't get through either one um, now. Um, I mean, I, I could, but I, why? I just didn't like it. Uh, they were just not good movies, and I remembered <laughs> specifically why. Um, I'll tell you what I think does happen is they may have seemed like they were good while they were making them. It, you often cannot tell. Um, by the way, sorry, I'm going to move. This is going to make a little noise there. OK, moving my microphone a little. Um, you often can't tell. In fact, you really never can tell when you are making something if it's going to work or not. Um, I thought Fracture was a disaster. I, I didn't think Fracture was going to be watchable. Um, and in many ways, it's got some problems, but it works. Um, no way to know. It, that felt like a disaster on uh, when we were working on it. Um, a lot of the movies that where you'd say, this has everything going for it. Great writer, great director, great subject, great cast, and they don't work. I mean, it, it happens. It's quite often. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the people who work on Casablanca had no idea they were making one of the most important films of all time. Uh, they were making a movie at the studio. It was just just a movie. Um, I mean, they were trying to do their best, but it's not like the people who were making Casablanca said, oh my God, we are making a, a, a film that will make all the difference to m filmmakers from here on. Um, I suspect that it felt really special to be working on Citizen Kane or It's a Wonderful Life, or Raging Bull, you know, some legendary films. However, they were flops. Um, they later were recognized for their greatness, but um, it's not like something necessarily, you're, you can't tell what is going to work. Um, so the, the, the basic issue I'm trying to raise here is, even when you are great at art, your work is going to be uneven. Um, and I really, I ask you to think about this. Is there such a person as a great artist, especially in, in collaborative art, like uh, movies and TV, that doesn't have an uneven career, doesn't have things that are, you know, just not up to their work? I was trying to think of, are there any artists that I could say they don't have uneven, there aren't goods and bad? Um, I was thinking about the uh, like Kubrick. Okay, Kubrick was intensely controlling and careful. He took forever to, to choose a project and to make a project. There was not a single frame that was not exactly what he thought was the best thing he could do. And still, I got to tell you, I believe Eyes Wide Shut is just terrible. There's a lot of great stuff in it, but, but um, Kubrick, you know, uneven. Um, Hitchcock, once again, uh, somebody who stuck to his lane, who was trying very hard to, to keep up with changing times, who was constantly trying to do something new and interesting. Uh, some of his movies just aren't that good. <laughs> They're just not. Um, and um, you know who I think actually are the most reliably even filmmakers are the bad ones, the, the play it safe ones, the ones who don't really have that much imagination. They are even in being not very good <laughs> uh, or or is distinctly bad. Uh, the, I, I, it may turn out that it, as we analyze this question, the quality of being a good artist means you will be an uneven artist. Whereas if you truly want to be reliable and safe, you will choose to be bad because bad, you, you can do it every time. Um, so that's something to think about. Um, if you are good, you are going to have highs and lows. You're going to have hits and misses. That it is. And I, I'm not saying you can't love a, a great artist's second-rate work. Uh, there are people, 
who who love Eyes Wide Shut, I am sure there are there are great scenes in Eyes Wide Shut. I think it's a terrible movie. Um, there are some people who feel that Cameron never made a bad movie. I don't personally like the Avatar movies, and I think True Lies isn't very good. Um, whereas I think The Abyss is terrific, and uh, a lot of people don't. Sometimes <laughs> the artists themselves don't know when their work is good. Uh, Martin Scorsese recently said in an interview that he regrets making The Color of Money. Color of Money is, in my opinion, a great film. Um, and he's like, well, I did it for the wrong reasons. It was sort of too commercial. It wasn't as experimental as I want. And I'm just thinking, Marty, <laughs> Marty, give it a rest. Give it a break. You are, you did, that is a great movie. Um, famously, John Sayles um, did one movie using studio financing. It's called Baby, It's You um, with Roseanne Arquette and, um, oh God, Vincent... Can't remember his last name. Uh, anyway, um, uh, it's. I think it's great. He hates it. He will not look at it. He won't talk about it. He hates that movie. I think it's great. Um, and uh, you know, it, it's just. Uh, I think that um, uh, sometimes you just need the work. Michael's right. And and what's more, Sidney Lumet in his book has said that has said a couple of his movies, and he won't say which ones he took simply because he wanted the job. It was just like he had to keep working and he did it. Um, and I believe that that is true, um, especially for people who don't have the power to choose. Remember, most artists working in the entertainment business do not get to choose what they do. They, get, they have to fight to try and get things done. And most of the time they get given things that the companies say they want and they have to work on those. Most artists in the entertainment field do not choose what they are doing. The few elite top 1% like these guys, like Scorsese and, and um, uh, Pollock and Lumet, they were choosing their work. Um, however, it, it, you get the sense, at least with Lumet, that he just felt he had to work. Um, anyway, uh, it is true that sometimes People are just doing it, like I said, to be part of the conveyor belt. It's time for me to make a movie because I'm a person who makes movies. Um, so that's also possible. I don't, like I said, there. I don't know the reasons that these movies are bad. I can. I, I just know that the important question that's being raised here, the lesson, is great. Even even great artists are uneven. They're, they're going to do bad work. And what does that tell us, those of us who are trying to be great or who will never be great but are doing our best? What do we learn from the fact that even the great are sometimes not great? Um, anyway, I, I, I want to just boil this down because I like to give, um, I like to raise these questions so that you remember to ask the questions, not to assume, ah, there is this hierarchy, this staircase of art, and you just try and march your way up it. It's not that simple. <laughs> um, the reasons that something works are very, very complicated. Um, but the lessons that I think we can take from this are, first of all, you cannot ensure greatness. You can just make art. That's all you can do. There's no way, even if you are a great filmmaker, you can't be sure that the movie you make will be great. There is no way. If you are a, even a painter, a novelist, whatever, you can't be sure when you work that the thing you're doing will be great. Sometimes it will work. Sometimes it won't. Um, I think a little corollary to that is it's really hard to do this. You know, um, I try to make it casual, take down the pressure and stuff. It is really hard to make art, to make good art, um, certainly. It's hard. It's really, really hard work. So that's just a minor lesson to take. But the main thing is, even if you do that really hard work, it may come out not that great. It may come out mediocre. It may. There's no way that you can guarantee that is not true. Um, if you look at the history of art, if you look at the history of film, and you really start to break it down, you recognize that even the great will make mediocre stuff. Um, even the great can't be sure that what they're doing will work, and you could reproduce everything about the, the process or the work that was great, and it won't come out the same way. Um, it's just not possible 
to ensure that your work will be great. That's the lesson number one. Lesson number two is most art is, like I said, it's hard. Most art is trying to be great. You know, we're all trying. We're, we're doing, uh, sometimes great is I'm going to do the best I can considering I got hired for this job. It's not what I want to do. Whatever it is, you still, you're trying to get it done under the circumstances as well as you can. Almost every artist, almost all the time, is really trying to do, they're trying to be great. Um, sometimes they're just, I, I'm so desperate to be great, I will do whatever I think the public wants. Um, but whatever it is, most art is trying to be great. But the truth is, there is no special thing that makes art great. There really isn't. There's no, there's no defining, ah, that's what does it. That you can be sure that, that that will make, you know, if you do X, Y, or Z, your work will be great. No way to know. You can cast the greatest cast. You can have the greatest script. You can be the finest filmmaker on earth, and you can still screw up. <laughs> it's just, it's possible. So therefore, I think the main lesson we have is great art is just regular art that goes well. Truly, we're always trying to make great art, and sometimes we do, and sometimes we don't. It, it may work. You can't control that. All you can do is do regular art, do your art, do the art that you think is the best you can make under the circumstances, and it may be great. Casablanca, they were not trying to make Citizen Kane when they made <laughs> Casablanca, and yet they made one of the great films of the 20th century. Um, they were just working at the best of their abilities in the studio system. Um, that's what's fascinating about some films. They're great, <laughs> but but they were just trying to be good. They were just trying to do as good as they could. Um, so I, I think that the most important thing to remember is great art is just regular art, which is we're always trying. We're always trying. And sometimes it goes well, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, so... <laughs> There's the question, is Ed Wood even? Yeah, I would actually say that Ed Wood is among the more, like his work is consistently Ed Woodish, ish um, and, and therefore, you know, God bless him. I, I think there's a greatness to that. Um, you are welcome, Anko, and hello, Roddy. Um, now, um, okay, Hiro says, the other day I was listening to someone who said, for a writer to be able to market himself, you have to focus on one genre. Do you believe it's the truth? That's a great question. I will get to it very shortly. Uh, I'm going to just run through my prepared questions, and then I will do it. Um, I think good or bad is super difficult to define. Uh, Before Sunrise was the best movie I've ever seen. My class would say it's boring. Yes, um, yes, there... Uh, Absolutely. This is goes without saying, as far as I hope by now you know me. Um, different people will define th different things as good or bad. Absolutely. But what I'm saying is even within whatever definition you have, you will find that the people who do the great art that you find is great are uneven. Um, and that the, the, the work that you feel is great, um, there will be greater and lesser amongst the great. Um, and the point about this is that what we consider greatness is, in fact, just being an artist. And that sometimes magic happens and sometimes it doesn't. And you cannot do anything to ensure that or, or um, steer yourself towards it except to do the best you know how. If you are doing the best you know how, you will may, it may indeed be great according to the, that definition that you have. Absolutely true. Um, there is, <laughs> uh, yeah, if you just, um, yeah, I, I mean, I personally feel that the movies that I was citing of these filmmakers are, are truly great. I believe that, that 12 Angry Men and, and even The Way We Were are truly great Hollywood movies of their moment. Um, so, um, I think the only thing that makes a piece, movie or whatever art is its connection we make with it, and not why art is relative, because, um, yeah, to a certain extent, I, I think um, within what I can understand from the way you phrase that, um, yes, each one of us has our own connection with art that helps us to define what is what we think is great. 
Um, some people may feel that art that tears down society is great, and others may be feel uh, art that restores society is great. Yeah, absolutely. Some people may feel long, slow, carefully composed things are great. Others maybe feel like broken up stuff is great. You can't define one or the other as actually great. I'm talking about within whatever you define as great, you will still find this issue. Because what I'm trying to do here in, in these, these little talks is provide you with a helpful uh, tidbit <laughs> lesson from an observation. That's what these I have thoughts are. I am trying to find something useful in a thing I notice uh, that I have thoughts about. Um, so let me talk about the other topic that I have thoughts about today, which is um, the question of being new or original. Um, there was an article uh, in this week, uh, yesterday actually, in the New York Times. Um, I put a link to it in the description in case you want to read it. Um, I don't agree with everything in it, um, it's called Why Culture Has Come to a Standstill um, by a guy named Jason Farrago. And um, uh, one thing he talks about is the, the concept that being new or original or groundbreaking, changing the art form, doing something never done before, was one of the defining qualities of modern art. In other words, one of the things that made something modern um, that, that made modern art considered good was that it was new or original or different. Um, and that that, that began um, in, the, in the mid um, 19th century. Um, and it was really the defining quality of 20th century art, especially. Um, and that, that we tend to take that for granted. Oh yeah, great art, new art, it has to be new. It has to be something different. Um, but that's actually not necessarily true. The definition of what made art great for a long time was not that it was new, but that it was within a tradition, that it was within a style and it was simply working within um, a particular accepted vision of the purpose of art, which could be to glorify the a religion or to please a patron or to challenge, whatever it was that people were defining as the tradition of their time, your goal was to be within the tradition. Uh, in the modern art period, the tradition was, screw tradition. <laughs> um, and that therefore all of us who are watching here, and uh, we all grew up in a world where new or original was defined as one of the things which made art good. However, this critic is saying, you know, it's possible in the 21st century that we've run out of new, <laughs> that that to a certain extent, not everything has been done, but um, but that the 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 idea of revolutionizing or or breaking new ground may have become too hard to do because we've done so much of it in the past 150 years. Um, is that true? I don't know. I, I think in some senses it may be. Um, I think it's also been true for a while now that the reason that there was a an art movement called postmodern was partly because of that concept, the idea that um, it's possible that new art should be made of pieces of old art <laughs> um, uh, with your own new truth brought into that. And I kind of like that idea. I kind of I kind of believe that and and this is what this article comes to at the end talking about Amy Winehouse and saying Amy Winehouse was both a, a treasure hunter among uh, 20th century music, and yet she was trying to find her own voice within these pieces that she was pulling together. Um, I just want to say, I think that's a good point. I think that's a good idea. I think that, that we, we spend too much time trying to um, understand, to trying to find some way to be so new and different um, when that may not be the most valuable thing. That's all. It's just a, just a thought that, that the idea that something has to be completely original or new in order to be valuable, I think that that's an old idea. I don't think it's valid anymore. Um, there was a period, mainly in the 20th century and even the, or the first two-thirds of the 20th century, when people were literally inventing new things. Um, that may not be our thing. 
Anyway, it's just a thought. Something to think about. I'm going to get to your questions now. Um, okay. Um, sometimes you spend years financing a project becomes outdated by the time it's made. Yes, <laughs> that is certainly true. Um, and Billy Wilder. Um, yeah, Billy Wilder is uneven and and truly, truly, truly one of made some of the greatest, my favorite films of all time. Um, I think that that Double Indemnity, Sunset Boulevard, The Apartment, um, these are are among the greatest movies of their time. And yet he also made um, you know some of his later films and some of his you know I yeah he's uneven guy the guy and he was great. <laughs> Um, hello, Pedro. Glad you're still lurking. Um, if art is about discovery, can it also be about discovering your audience? Yes, completely. Um, not only that, um, it it can um, it can be about discovering something very small and personal. Um, that that's what I think. Hey, Aries Aurelian. Um, uh, yes. What what is what is your waving about? <laughs> Wait, tell me why you're waving. Um, we had modern, postmodern, and now we have sequels and remakes. Yeah, that's a business move, though. That's not an artistic move. I guarantee you there's no artist saying, oh, what I really, really believe in is sequels and remakes. That's a business choice. Um, business is limiting um, our our ability to make art. <laughs> um, and that's actually one of the things that, that I, I do want to mention. Um, uh, the, the idea of progress... Um, the idea that that all of human culture is this this like I said this staircase marching towards better and better. Um, uh, this article says um, the modernist cultural explosion might very well have been like the economy more generally, not the perpetual forward march we were promised in the 20th century, but a one-time only rocket blast followed by a long, slow, disappointing glide. In other words. Things that have happened in the past hundred or so years, which we take as defining where we're going, may have been a unique moment in which it was going like that, and now it's not going to go like that. Um, he says, the transformative growth of the period between 1870 and 1970 may have been an anomalous super event fueled by unique and unrepeatable innovations, electricity, sanitation, the combustion engine, whose successor, above all, information technology, have not had the same impact. Um, but then the other question is, the impact of the digital age that we are now in, um, there's two things that happened. One is it disconnected, his, his point is, it could be that simply because the digital, digital age has changed our, our abilities and our resources in certain ways, um, we may have actually ended the concept of progress because we've got so much in one place that there isn't a chronological rise. Things may just be spread out all over the place. Um, what they call, you know, like broken into many, many, many different um, cultures that are all existing at the same time. Um, the other thing is, um, <laughs> the digital revolution is controlled by essentially relatively few companies at this point. And um, it can very may be true that our art is going to be squeezed, possibly almost out of existence, because the um, original promise of digital technology, that the, the, the democratization, the ability of everyone to do everything, has been bottlenecked up by relatively few companies that are now in complete control of the culture. And that's worrisome because they have their own agenda. And their algorithms and their choices are for themselves, not for the greatness of the culture. So. Uh, my point here is things are changing. Whatever's happening in the 21st century, you can't judge by 20th century or 19th century um, uh, visions. You go, we're going to have to figure out what is going on in the 21st century. That's your job. You are 21st century artists. Even if you're an old 21st century artist like me, um, you are still, your job is to recognize where you are and what the world is that you are now in and not just say, well, 
you know, in 1957, this was the definition of greatness. I'm clinging to that. It's changed. Um, okay, I'm gonna kind of do some uh, very quick uh, comments. Um, I felt the commercial. Yeah, I mean, the, I, I don't. I believe that there is. Um, <laughs> the thing about Tarantino is his constant content is authentic. It is genuine to him. I, I think he is rather shallow and immature, but damn, he's talented. And his, his content is real. He really, really feels what he is doing. He is not doing it simply to please. He is not doing it simply to make a hit. He is doing it because it is his genuine vision. And I give him credit for that, even though I don't think it's the deepest stuff you've ever seen, but it's pretty great. Um, I don't feel like sneakers or the usual suspects were necessarily new, but they were smart. Yes, absolutely. I agree. Both of those are delightful, delightful um, 90s movies. They were 90s, weren't they? Maybe later. Um, sneakers. Um, there's a little thriller, uh, Robert Redford, Ben Kingsley, um, Phil Alden Robinson, I believe, made it. Uh, Usual Suspects, obviously, is, is um, uh, oh gosh, what's his name? The, the writer, Macquarie. Um, really terrific script. Um, anyway, those are, yeah, they're, they are working within a genre, um, doing some nice tweaks and twists within it, but this is just good work, absolutely. The worst thing about movies as an art form is that it's a business and vice versa. Yes, Karn. Karn is right. Um, at least I say. Hello. Very nice shirt. Thank you. Um, Gap. Well, Gap on sale, actually. Um, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying that art is going to end. I'm saying currently our art business has gotten strangleholded, which was true, by the way, in the 1940s, too. Um, the, the movie business was strangled by a bunch of, and, and a lot of people were dissatisfied with movies at that time. There will be a breakdown, there will be a breakthrough, there will be alternatives. And that's what I'm saying is it's your job to look around and say, oh, we are currently monopolized here, but this indie thing is happening here, I can work there. That's your job. Figure that out. Either if you want to work in the monopoly and you can find a way in, cool, that's great. Hitchcock did it. Lumet did it. I am not saying you shouldn't do it. I'm saying if you can't do it or if you don't like it, if you are a Cassavetes who's looking around in 1970 and saying, I don't want to make the movies that the studios are making, maybe you can create independent film as he did. Okay, let me do a couple of quick uh, questions that were asked earlier. Um, okay, Lan. Lan Friedman asked a question, which is a good one. How do you avoid or test if your work feels episodic or predictable? Does each subsequent scene need to follow but then as opposed to add then? Yes, that does make sense. It's, it's kind of two questions. Um, first of all, and this is really important, there's nothing wrong with episodic. Episodic can be great. First of all, um, even, even you know some movies are highly episodic. Episodic is simply a form of story. <laughs> That's not a bad story. It's a form of story. If you are trying to tell a traditional Hollywood three-act movie, you don't want to be episodic. Yes, fine. But but let's just watch out here for slandering the episodic. Um, second of all, um, how do you test if it's... Uh, see, episodic and predictable. These are two very, very different things because predictable... Very often, something that is not predict that is not episodic is immensely predictable. It's one of the big problems with movies lately is a lot of them are too predictable because they are being written according to this formula, um, which says this will be successful, which it won't. There's no guarantee that if you fit the formula, it will actually be successful. Um, however, let's assume you a don't want to be episodic and do want to fit the four, the three-act Hollywood formula, then the question is, how do you know that each scene um, will will not be disconnected or episodic or, or obvious? The answer is, and I, I don't mean this to sound obvious, tell a good story. In other words, if you have um, begun your story by involving your uh, audience in the uh, goals and obstacles of characters, um, and then you are taking each thing that happens and saying, well, what what is the, the consequence going to be 
for this person reaching their goal, what do they have to do? That's going to stop you from being um, predictable and episodic. Well, not predictable, but it will stop you from being episodic. Um, the thing to stop you from being predictable is you have to decide how unpredictable you want to be because you can just say, is this new? Is this offbeat? Is this something that isn't what you would expect? The problem with being unpredictable is that it goes outside the formula and that is risky. There's a, a wiggle room that you're trying to hit where you're staying within the formula but being novel, unpredictable in it. And I would say that's your goal. That's what you have to assign yourself. There isn't a test like, like uh, you know, is it three pages? <laughs> that won't do it. What will do it is if you can think, I have seen this in 47 other movies, it's predictable. If you have seen, I've never seen this in any movie and it's kind of striking me as impossible, that's probably too unpredictable. You need to use your judgment because you are the writer. <laughs> um, and the answer is, um, episodic, you, you get rid of by sticking to your story. The more that things are uh, d driven by the character having a goal, and I, need, I, I, don't, I don't always want to um, <laughs> quote myself, but I do believe that this will help. The, the, the video I made called The Six Essential Questions, um, essentially that's defining the character has something they want and they are, have things that are making it difficult and therefore they have to take action. As long as you are operating on that principle, you probably won't be episodic. Whether or not you will be predictable has to do with whether or not you've seen a lot of different stuff so that you can imagine going outside the obvious and becoming unpredictable. The other way that I believe you can become unpredictable is by um, blending. For instance, if you are working in a genre that's very dark and you add in something that's very soft or human or funny, um, that will be unpredictable. If you, in general, if you try to um, have yourself not stick to too narrow a standard, but you say, in the course of this, like, I want to make this personal, even though everything else has been borrowed from other movies. Whatever you can do, that will tend to make things unpredictable. Um, so I hope that helps you, Lan. Um, let's see. Let me just check some comments. Um, <laughs> when I grow up, I want to be Tim Burton. Um, Tim Burton probably will object, <laughs> but but I know what you mean. And um, I, you know, I don't know. I I have mixed feelings about Tim Burton. I feel like he tends to to me, he tends to be. Um, superficial, shallow. Um, and I don't just mean because he's good visually, because he's great visually. Um, but very often his his stuff, f to me, leaves me cold. I feel like it is mechanically ideal, very well done, but, um, but there's a remove, a distance from the characters. That could just be me, but that's, that's my problem with Tim Burton. Um, and obviously not always. Uneven. And he, he's a good filmmaker. So uneven. Uh, people always say they can't think of ideas to write. I am the opposite. I have to have many ideas. Um, I attempt to write three or four scripts at a time without getting anything done. Any advice? Yes. Um, actually, uh, here in this video, uh, this one, brainstorming and scrap piles. I talk about the idea among this idea of scrap piles. Um, if you have too many ideas, write them down and put them in a folder somewhere. Stick to maybe two, maybe maybe three if you can. If you're not getting anything done, stick to one. If you feel like you just need to work on two at a time, cool, work on two. But the main thing is you have to choose one that you say, this is the one I really have to get done no matter what. And if I have to sacrifice everything else, cool. That sacrifice is putting things aside, writing them down, don't lose them. But do choose, make a choice. Writing is making choices. So the answer is, if you have a lot of ideas, don't try to not have ideas, that won't work. You're always gonna have ideas. Find a place, just put them, pile them up. You'll get to them later. Do one now. That's my advice. Um, okay. Um, slow down on the questions for a second. I've been sending my short script through festivals and comps. Uh, to, 
two big lessons I've learned. One, judging is an opinion. Yes. <laughs> and two, don't wait to be discovered. Make yourself. Roddy, Roddy, I love you. Roddy, everyone should take note of this. This is very, very, very good. This is good advice. Um, hello, Kirby. Um, have you ever read a script where you thought, what were the producers thinking? Oh, God, sure, all the time. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I've seen movies, finished movies where I've thought that. Um, although most of the time you can tell what they were thinking, you just go, oh, I wish they hadn't been thinking that. Um, you know, you can say, oh, they thought showing a lot of women in bathing suits is cool, or, or they thought, you know, having somebody kill everyone in sight is going to make the audience love this. I don't know. Whatever they thought, you can usually see what they thought. You just wish they hadn't thought it. Um, okay. Yay, great. Okay, good. I'm very glad. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, yes, Donna. Well, hi, Donna. Um, yes. Okay. Um, uh, Karn says, very similar. The reason I've never finished often because I was never going to accept that it was going to be bad, very bad, before it comes anywhere near close. Yes, that is a separate issue, which is very, very valuable, which is everyone who wrote, creates anything, you go through phases where the thing is not good enough. That is part of the creative process. Um, please, I do, I do beg you to look at my, my short videos. So many of them are about this, are about the idea that it is a process. Um, and it is really important that you get used to the idea that part of the process is sketching, improvising, doing stuff that may not be right, but it is a step towards or is just preparing the ground for the thing that will be your best. Um, it does not come out <laughs> all done. It doesn't. Nobody has, I mean, there have now and then been stories about some filmmaker who's like, oh, you know, I thought about this story for 13 years and I wrote it in two weeks. Cool. Those 13 years in their head, they were doing the bad versions. Um, that's all that is. Nobody ever gets it all right at once. Uh, truly, truly, truly. Um, be okay with writing the bad story and know it'll get better with work. Absolutely. Um, I actually think that um, that Arfung's uh, situation is different than yours, Karn. I think Arfung is simply excited by each new thing as it comes along. At least that's how I feel. It's like the new thing always looks easier and better than the old thing. And if you keep thinking of new things, you just keep discarding the old ones. And the answer is no, you must finish the one you're working on before you do the new one. <laughs> um, <laughs> Did Tim Burton never grow up? Fair question, although that is actually one of his um, good qualities, his his childlikeness. Um, I feel about Fincher the way you feel. Yes. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I feel that way about Fincher, but I mostly like it. <laughs> um, it is, you always, you see the machinery working. Um, that is absolutely true. Um, I just feel like, in the good Fincher, that is in service of an emotional um, uh, uh, catharsis, an emotional revelation, uh, an intellectual discovery. I mean, I think something like um, Seven or um, uh, Fight Club, um, they're just magnificent um, because that um, very obvious artistry is pushing you towards the great things. That's actually what I like about Pollock and Lamette too, when they're when they're doing well. Um, why so many stupid remakes? Because com cor currently corporations are trying to um, figure out what it is that sells, and in a sort of self um, self created uh, algorithmic fallacy, they have seen that. Um, Remakes, uh, remakes, and um, franchises made more money because there was a a built-in audience. Now, somebody will come to the next movie because they liked the last one. Whereas an, a movie that's original and new, you have to you can't you have to get people to want to see it. Um, so that's why they do it, um, and also because 
almost all of these remakes and franchises are also selling something else. They are usually selling some form of merchandise or a universe. In some way, it is part of a larger corporate sales plan. Um, okay. <laughs> Showing a lot of women in bathing suits is cool. Good joke. Um, Okay, Michael says, I've been working on a script for four months, started an outline for a new script, but having difficult going back. To yes, it is. Okay, this is true. This is true. This is the same issue as that was raised before. It is really hard to stick to something and get it done. <laughs> That's, that is part of the problem with writing longer narratives. Um, if you're writing a short story, it wouldn't be quite as hard, although there are people who spend a year on a short story. The main thing about the kind of artwork that I'm trying to help you do is, yes, you have to be prepared to do it a little bit at a time over a long period of time. That is the form of the work. That is how it must be done. So learn to build yourself a process that helps. Um, I would suggest uh, two videos. This one, create... Uh, a ritual. I'm just writing down so I can. I'm going to put a link to that, um, to these later. And the other one is this small steps. Because the truth is, if you simply take a step, if all you wrote was one sentence every day, it would take a long time, but you would get done. You have to, you know, 90% of success is showing up. The famous quote, different versions of it. The thing is, people don't understand. Showing up does not mean actually just being. <laughs> just like, I'm showing up, I'm here. Does that count? Give me a gold star. Showing up means doing the work. 90% of success is doing the work. If you just show up every day and do the work, even a little bit, you can get it done and it will be as good as you can make it, which can be quite good. Okay. Um, is it possible to make a splash like El Mariachi in a time when filmmaking tools are available? No. <laughs> no, that is a great question and, and a genuine a new thing. El Mariachi, um, Clerks, um, there were a bunch of, of ultra, ultra low budget movies came out in the 90s. Um, late 80s, uh, in the case of, I think, uh, Brothers McMullen, a couple others. Um, there was a fad for people who were like, I'm going to make a movie for the least possible amount of money because that way I can do it indie style, run and gun, get it done. And now and then, in that way, new, energetic, fun, cool, visionary directors were discovered. Um Likewise, Christopher Nolan, following. Um, the answer is no. At the time that that happened, there was a, a system by which films were released. It was a bottleneck, but for a little while, that bottleneck opened up to the genre of the undiscovered indie. And so for about 10, 20 years, that was a thing you could do. Now, that is very, very hard to do. Most of, the, of it is going through YouTube or other things like that. In other words, um, the way that people are getting discovered is because they have a channel and they're making films and there's a vision or a style there. Um, that's the new El Mariachi. Um, TikTok also. Um, okay. Um, no more questions. We're at the end of the hour. Um, I work on a big VFX studio, and most of the times we're very aware of our work is being misused to hide a bad story. <laughs> That's how we use CGI is bad for films. Yes, this is true. Um, yeah, as always, any technology um, has uses, but is not in itself the answer. Um, the, the answer is that you still, and, and you know, there are some real joys in what we can do with, with CGI now. There's some great work that can be done, but it can't be done simply good CGI will be a good film. You also need a story, or if not a story, a vision. You know, you might be able to do some really cool CGI stuff that simply explores a world without telling a story. I, I, it is possible to do that. Um, 
the main thing is, uh, yes, um, CGI technology does not in itself guarantee a great story any more than having a hero who obtains their goal and learns uh, a lesson is going to be um, a great story. It's just one of the technical elements by which you can do it. Um, I'm actually writing a script based on my personal experience in LA, but also have a great idea of a fair of US president and other idea. Yeah, um, yeah, it's uh, sure. These are all good ideas. Good. Uh, there are. There is no end to good ideas. The thing is, if you don't actually write the script and make it good from your good idea, you have not done your job. <laughs> it's just that simple. Part of the job, and you have to learn this part of the job, is how do I choose one, commit to it, and get it done? That's why I suggest looking at those videos. I'll put the links down uh, in the description after this video is done. About 10 minutes later, look, create a ritual and small steps. These are my best advice. Anyways, <laughs> what are the bad finchers? Um, I'm really not a fan of Gone Girl, but I don't think it was that great a book. I, it was actually a really well-written book, but it, not a great story. Um, a cool structure, but not, um, yeah. Uh, that one really disappointed me. I can't actually remember some of the bad ventures, but I love I love Social Network. I think that um, Benjamin Button is brilliant, but flawed, but it's pretty amazing. Um, anyway, um, advice on considering page length. Want to expand more, but not have the script too. Yeah, do not. OK, here's the answer. Um, if you are writing something that you are planning to submit to the current entertainment industry, um, for financing, and you are breaking the you know, 90 to 110 page limit on feature scripts, you are simply shooting yourself in the foot. I am not saying you can't make a great 70 page script. I'm not saying you can't make a great 150 page script. I'm saying the people who read it will consider you incompetent. Um, now and then, you may be able to get someone's attention by saying, I'm going to give them 150 pages. But remember, they don't want to read. They are overloaded with scripts. They would rather have 90 to 100 pages um, and, and a fast read. Um, no, no, it's not a problem. Um, OK. Uh, hi, Willabed. Um, Yay! <laughs> Yay! I'm so glad. Thank you. Well, he's just Willie Bad is just saying um, he's finding finding some good material in my videos, which I beg you to do. Look at these three playlists. Almost everything that you have asked me, I have answered somewhere in these 50 short videos. I've spent the past three years making these 50 videos, which are essentially my book. Um, maybe one day I'll try and turn them into a book, but right now I'm busy, so I can't. Um, okay, a Alien 3 is is borderline, but damn, it's good. Alien 3 is really good, but it's also a disaster area. And Alien 3, if you ever get the chance, there is a uh, DVD set of like, I don't know, 9, 12 DVDs of the first four Alien movies, each one in two different versions plus um, uh, behind the scenes making of videos. The making of video of Alien 3 is astonishingly interesting um, and really cool. Anyway, Alien 3, yeah, I, I love that. I think it's really good. It's, it's, not, it's flawed, but I would not make that, I would not say it's bad Fincher. Fincher would say it's bad, <laughs> um, which adds to the thing that sometimes a filmmaker will hate a movie of theirs for some reason, and yet we can all love it. OK, I don't know if it's because Glenn's touching a table or not. Um, yeah, it could be. Uh, I don't know the answer. I will try and not bang, bang the table. Um, I'm an episodic writer. My characters are thoroughly developed, but I come up with vastly different versions of what their arcs could be, and I can't decide. Can't decide. OK, your answer. There's two problems here. Um, and let's talk about the one. One is if you are an episodic writer, maybe you should write in a form that allows episodic. For instance, um, there is a TV series uh, I, I recently watched called Reservation Dogs. It's on Hulu. It is 
brilliant. It is magnificent. I love it. Reservation Dogs, uh, showrunner Sterling Harjo. It is episodic. That It is like a collection of interrelated short stories. It has an overall arc, but it is, so that's a form you might find useful. Don't write a feature if you want to write episodic or write an independent episodic feature that you can make. Anyway, the answer is, as far as episodic, just be episodic. As far as I can't decide, decide. <laughs> um, this is hard, but the answer is, it, writing is making choices. Um, at a certain point, if you find yourself completely unable to make a choice, make one, if, if necessary, randomly, or in some way, preserve for yourself the option of doing the other thing later, but, but ex choose one and explore that to the best of your abilities and see how it goes. You can always go back. Nobody is watching. Um, not deciding is the worst option. Deciding badly is far better <laughs> than not deciding. Um, okay. Two drafts and countless rewrites. I need to put it away. Um, cool. Good, good, good. Okay, no more comments. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, now I love Fight Club. Um, okay, now, um, for me, it's not because the new ones are more exciting, but I think my idea, all my ideas are worth developing. I try to write them all at the same time. Right, well, um, just practically speaking, you're not going to be able to. So, so whether or not, uh, for whatever reason, if you are multitasking too much, choose one thing and stick to it until it is done. You will get more done by doing that sequentially than you would by trying to do them all at the same time. Um, uh, oh, that's right. Okay. Hiro's question. Um, thank you for reminding me. Um, Hiro said, let me see if I can find this. I'm just going to, I'm going to say it. Um, the other day I was listening to someone who said for a writer to be able to market him or herself, you have to focus on one genre. Do you believe that's the truth? Okay. Great question, Hiro. Thank you. Um, to be marketable in the business, yes, it is easier. It is not absolute, but it is e far easier if you choose one genre to work within. Now, I never did that. That hurt my career. I, there's no question about it. Um, the problem is, it's my nature. I like lots of different things. I like lots of different um, genres. Um, but the truth is, if I had chosen romantic comedies or thrillers and I had stuck with it, I would have a greater ability to be put up for jobs and to be, um, uh, my choices would be um, funneling into a marketplace. That is just, yes, it is easier. It is absolutely better for your marketing, your branding, to choose a genre and stay to it. However, and this is a big however, you may be artistically better off not doing that, like I was. Um, you need to weigh everything is a choice, and every choice has a price. Uh, I, I know I have that slogan somewhere. I, I got to start finding it. Yeah, here it is. Everything is a choice, and every choice has a price. So you may say, I'm going to do better work by doing lots of different genres, and the, I'm willing to pay the price that it may be harder to sell me. Yes. Or I am going to make the choice to stay in one genre for a while so that it's easier to sell me, and then when I have built up my power and reputation, I can afford to break out a little bit. That's your choice. There's not a right or wrong. You have to decide which price you feel comfortable paying. Okay. Um, hi, Whispered Wonders. I've never met you. How did you know you wanted to become a writer? Um, short answer to this is I was a big imaginer, a big reader, um, f ever since I could read, ever since I was born. Uh, that, was, that was my nature. It connected to reading watching movies, watching plays, looking at art, the things that pleased me as a consumer. And at a certain point, 
for a long time, I simply thought, oh, I just want to live in books. I want to live in movies. Um, at a certain point, probably around 10 years old, 11 years old, it occurred to me that somebody wrote those books and that the ability to live inside them could be accessed by writing them. Or, you know, I could have just become an English professor or something. Um, but that's the answer. Or sometime around 10 or 11 years old, it occurred to me that the pleasure I took from reading would be more within my control by writing. And, and uh, it's, it is literally to me like a drug. Um, and I mean a drug like, or, uh, like, like a, a, a necessary medication. <laughs> that's, that, so that's the answer. Is, and, and I struggled with it. I've, in, in, my, uh, in my video, Fear of Writing, I talk about um, the struggle. Um, it wasn't easy. It took me 20, 30 years to get to comfortable with the things I am telling you guys now. That's, that's why I'm doing this channel is because it took me 30 or more years to learn this stuff that I am telling you in very short bits. It took me decades. So that is why I'm doing this. And the answer is because I was so desperate for this medication of art, so desperate for this medication that I needed on a daily basis of creative thinking that I was willing to figure out how to take small steps and create a ritual and accept the reality of the business. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Um, no, no, writing a treatment, uh, writing an outline will help. But, but you have to remember, you're talking to somebody who believes there is no such thing as a bad idea. Um, I think I've talked about this in some other live streams, but the answer is, I do not believe there is such a thing as a bad idea. Um, the, what, the question is, what are you going to do with this idea? You know, uh, there, there are most of the things that are great were bad ideas. <laughs> most of the things that we look upon as great work, you could look at it and say, oh, that's a bad idea. That breaks this rule or it goes against this trend or it's been done before. All those reasons why it's a bad idea don't matter if what you're doing with it is powerful and authentic and yours. Um, so therefore, I don't think there is a bad idea. However, the question of whether or not it's an idea you want to consider writing to complete the process of, that you can have that choice. You can say, this idea is not a good one for me to pursue. Not that it's not a good idea, but I, it's not a good idea. And the way that you do that is outlining, not treatment. A treatment is a summary. It glosses over a lot of stuff and promises things. An actual outline where you figure out what's happening scene to scene will help you to know whether or not you can write or should write something. Cool. If you're a serialized TV writer, write serialized TV or write a story or a collection of stories or a feature that is episodic. That's that's going to be your style. Um, <laughs> Karn, I'm kind of with you on that. Even I mean, I can I can even watch Gone Girl and I think Gone Girl is terrible. Um, Yes, yeah. From what I understand, I don't, I, you know, I can obviously not speak for the indigenous people in America. However, I do know that um, every single writer, director, and actor, well, not every actor, but almost every actor um, in Reservation Dogs is Native American, indigenous American, and, and it speaks more, tr seemingly more authentically about that, their lives than I ever could. And that's one of the things I love about it. Um, I, I, was, I read an interview with Sterling Harjo and he was talking about the influence that Atlanta had on him. Because I remember when I saw Atlanta, which is another magnificent series, um, coming from a group of people and a, a social group that I am not part of. And therefore, one of the joys for me watching it was to say, wow, they don't care about me as an audience. I'm not the audience. So I get to see this 
what I think is an authentic voice speaking authentically to other people in this group. And, and by the blessings of art, it's allowing the rest of us in. And I believe that is what all art should do. Um, anyway, so uh, there you go. I'm going to sign off now. Thank you for stopping the questions. I really appreciate that. <laughs> um, and uh, that's it. That's it. We're good. I will uh, see you all next week. In the meantime, make choices, <laughs> make some choices and get things done. Go write something.